naval artillery has a long, if somewhat interrupted, history. In the next few weeks, we're going to look at the rise and fall of ancient naval artillery. But for the minute, we're going to start to look at the heavy guns that would characterise a good half millennium of human naval combat. The spread of gunpowder weapons across the world was gradual, starting out in Eastern Asia, almost certainly in China, and then spreading south into the Western Pacific region, and then southwest and west into India, and then on into what was then Persia and the Middle East. By the 1300s, gunpowder firearms had spread to Europe and were being used in a variety of battlefield and siege conditions to batter down walls, scare horses, and somewhat decisively bypass armour. Many of these early guns did not fire what we would think of as cannonballs. The largest would fire a large round shot, usually made of stone, but smaller ones would fire either an, like an early form of shotgun or else would project gigantic arrows, sometimes with an inventive variety of payloads attached to the head. There were also a number of major issues with these early guns. Indeed, a number of the earliest handheld firearms deployed to medieval battlefields resembled nothing less than what we today would think of as, of as a scaled-down cannon attached to the other end of a very long stick. This was because guns could be made of bronze, which was hideously expensive, and due to the ductile nature of the material also had a limited lifespan before work hardening caused by the blasts made them dangerous, and they'd have to be scrapped. Or guns could be made of iron. Now, whereas a bronze gun required a single intensive casting, along with a bit of finishing, an iron gun was much cheaper, and was often built with knowledge adapted from barrel making, hence gun barrel. Unfortunately, iron guns also had a very distressing habit of actively distributing themselves and their crews across the surrounding landscape on a worryingly frequent basis, unless they were so heavily built that you might as well have gone with the expense of a bronze gun anyway. And they were also remarkably non-discriminatory in the people that they killed. Several kings lost their lives when their favourite guns just decided that they were going to fire themselves all over the place instead of their projectile. Large-scale ironworking had not quite reached the level of quality control necessary for the reliable mass production of iron cannon at anything approaching an industrial scale. Now, when it came to taking something that involved fire, explosives, random explosions, and extremely heavy loads aboard ships made of wood, canvas, and tar, most captains were understandably reluctant. But a few intrepid individuals were determined to discover new and interesting ways to disassemble their enemies, and within a few decades of their appearance, gunpowder artillery began to show up aboard various warships in small numbers. In Western Europe, the first use of guns aboard ships appears to have been amongst an English fleet near the start of the Hundred Years' War, although it seems to have been more a novelty than a widespread practice, and it's unclear if this was a deliberate attempt to create a ship that was armed with guns, or simply a practical use of guns that the ship was already carrying anyway for use in a land campaign, and those aboard had simply decided to use them for deterrent value, or possibly some form of practical engagement value. The ship was also notably carrying a single handheld firearm. Back over in Asia, things had become a little bit more organised, with standardised guns in relatively large quantities being used by the end of the 14th century. There were, however, a number of further limits to the use of naval guns at this time. The ships themselves were generally quite small, and at least in Europe, mostly clinker-built. This meant they couldn't support many, or especially heavy, guns to start with. Apart from anything else, the hulls would begin to warp, and cutting gun ports could seriously compromise the ship's structure and survivability in high seas. Finally, and as a result of the above, the decks of the ships were generally not strong enough to support large numbers of heavy point loads. Thus, these initial guns had very limited locations on a typical ship where they could be deployed, and would have to be of a relatively light nature, at least compared to what was eventually to come. There were now two advances that began to see the more widespread use of cannon. On the clinker-built ships of older design, the strongest points were in the bow and stern, where there was a greater concentration of strong timbers and less movement of the hull. 
In these vessels, reinforced platforms could be constructed over relatively small areas that allowed for the installation of a single large heavy gun or a few smaller weapons on the relevant platform. These were generally used for shore bombardment due to their normally fixed nature and slow rate of fire, although a few installations had a small degree of movement allowing them to adjust their horizontal aim without having to change the course of the ship itself. Due to the nature of the ship construction in the areas where these kinds of ships, most often galleys, were employed, a lucky hit from a shot with one of these guns could see a similar type of ship fly apart into planking and matchwood with a single well-placed hit. But the greater advancement was the development and spread of carvel-built ships. These were larger, more rigid, and significantly structurally stronger than the older designs. As such, they were often also largely or purely sail-powered, which freed up substantial internal volume and hull area for away from oars for other purposes, such as guns. Even so, the primary method of ship-to-ship -ship combat remained the boarding action, with heavy guns still mostly mounted on the more difficult-to-manoeuvre two-wheel gun carriages that were effectively unchanged from their land-based counterparts, relying more on friction than anything else to prevent unwanted movement around the ship, and hence they were relatively difficult to move around at the best of times. Reloading was a deeply complex process that could in some cases involve sending people on ropes climbing down outside the ship in order to reload. More common were smaller single or two-man weapons that were usually mounted to the ship's sides or in a crow's nest. These had limited anti-shipping potential but were good at taking out men, and between them, the objective was to disorganise and dis diminish the enemy crew prior to a boarding attempt. In defence against the same kind of action, the fore and after castles of the developing galleons would also often mount guns that faced back or forwards across their own decks to provide a crossfire against enemy boarders, who would often be resisted from these more fortified areas of the ship. The fore and after castles would also contain a smattering of these lighter guns on the broadsides and ahead and aft in order to unleash volleys of anti-personnel fire from the vantage points that they provided. Most ships of this period also had a relatively short length to beam ratio, which limited broadside space but also made them relatively agile, and so guns were generally distributed all around the ship with no particular emphasis on a given facing, since a ship may both find itself attacking or defending from almost any angle, and could usually turn to present a new face in relatively short order. Galleys, of course, were a completely different matter. With that said, naval technology continued to advance, and a couple of key breakthroughs appeared during the latter part of the 15th and into the early 16th century. These were the naval gun carriage, a mounting that used four small wheels uh, instead of two large ones and a friction brace. This made guns much easier to move around, but necessitated a complex rope and pulley system to both restrain them when they fired and then wheel them back out into a ready firing position, and also to prevent them moving around un in unwanted directions whilst the ship was underway. This in turn meant that reloading from inside the ship was far easier and faster in the case of muzzle-loading varieties, as well as allowing the guns to be much more easily adjusted for aim in battle situations. Just as important was a system of reinforcements for the decks of the ships. This allowed the carriage of not only more, but also heavier guns, and also allowed them these heavier weapons to be carried higher in the ship, which made both multiple gun decks and heavy broadsides possible. This particular advancement is usually credited to the Portuguese in the latter part of the 15th century, as Portugal was a major player on the oceanic naval stage at this time. The guns themselves also consisted of two major types beyond the iron and bronze divide, and the size variations which we'll discuss later. Most iron guns, built up in sections as described previously, were relatively primitive breech loaders, but there were also muzzle loaders. The new gun carriage system made the reloading of these more accurate and stronger muzzle loading weapons a lot easier. The ac increased accuracy was partly down to the fact that early breech loaders were not known for being entirely properly sealed, and thus the force of the shot was somewhat variable. Additionally, the difference in size between shot and barrel could 
see what was by now normally a spherical shot made of iron or stone bounce around on its way out of the gun. The more precise casting of bronze muzzle loaders would reduce these problems quite considerably. With this spread of practical naval gun batteries, corps of naval gunners would now start to show up as a standard profession aboard ship, as opposed to the small cadres of specialists brought in at great expense and supplemented by larger numbers of relatively inexpert general crew that had been the practice before. Still, these advances in technology and tactics were not reflected universally. In the Mediterranean, the galley with fore and aft guns would evolve into the Gallias, a strange hybrid that was somewhat akin to a lower profile and elongated galleon with a galley-like bank of oars. With their lower centre of mass, they could concentrate large numbers of heavy guns in their fore and after castles, as well as broadside guns above the oar deck, as well as having a full rig of sail. This allowed them to retain the wind-independent movement of a galley, as well as having many of the advantages, at least in theory, of a sail-powered large vessel like a galleon. They indeed would prove devastatingly effective in combat in the Mediterranean environment against the fleets of more conventional galleys, as their strong construction and large size made them daunting prospects at the best of times, and their heavy gun batteries were able to lay waste to anything smaller than them that happened to come into range. In this theatre, the great galleons that cogs and hulks and round ships had evolved into by way of the Carrack in the oceanic environments of Western Europe were somewhat out of place. Their dependence on sail in a highly variable and often calm Mediterranean environment would see them without propulsion as often as not, which was something of a disadvantage in battle. And even when they were able to get moving, the lighter galleys and other local sail-powered craft could often just run rings around them. But at the same time, they were an even more formidable, formidable obstacle than a galleus. Their high sides and large dimensions making them almost unassailable, as they often would drift, somewhat bemused, through conflicts where they could devastate an enemy fleet that strayed a bit too close, but could also be relatively easily avoided and sometimes surrounded by smarter crews in swifter ships. That said, boarding was still a major factor in this kind of warfare. Partly as a result of operating in both the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, and also due to the inertia that often comes from being the top navy, the Spanish took galleons to the extreme. Every oceanic European power built bigger and more powerful ships with the Mary Rose, the Great Harry, the Great Michael, San Juan de Baptista, Alder von Lübeck, and so on exemplifying this. But it would be Spain, in the ascendancy on the back of wealth plundered from the Inca and Aztec empires and the surrounding regions, that would extend this to the final form of the great broadside and then board galleon concept, with ships like the San Martin, San Juan, Gran Grin, Nuestra Señora del Rosario, Reganzona, Trinidad Val Valencera, and Santa Ana, all either built in or for Spain, or else requisitioned from vassals. These ships would all be present in the famous Spanish Armada, and all exceeded a thousand tons displacement, making them absolutely huge ships for their time. Whilst other powers would generally try to keep up, Necessity is the mother of invention, and a number of navies found themselves going in other directions. The Dutch, for instance, simply couldn't build such massive vessels. They possessed the technical capability, and indeed the seamanship, but the ships themselves, with their towering castles, heavy gun payloads, and thus deep drafts, simply were unusable in the shallow Dutch waters. The English, are vastly economically outcompeted by a nation that could bring in treasure ships so full of gold and silver that they sometimes would use the silver to literally replace the ballast on their yearly voyages, were likewise forced to look elsewhere. And so, in both of these countries and others, a smaller and faster vessel began to develop, the so-called race-built galleon, which also traced its origins back to vaguely legitimate but mostly piratical activity undertaken by independent sailors from these nations who wanted a share of Spain's pickings. This type of ship would cut down the fore and after castle, 
and reduce the numbers of troops present, instead increasing the number of guns and gunners, employing considerably more heavy guns on the four-wheeled gun carriages, starting a trend towards gunpower being the primary deciding factor in naval engagements. To be clear, this was a far cry from later line-of-battle tactics, although some engagements by the time of the Armada had already seen the early use of these methods. The method of fire at this time generally was to give a broadside, and then wheel to fire the forward guns, then the other broadside, and then the stern guns, in a sort of a carousel fashion. In theory, by the time the ship came around again, the first broadside would have reloaded. The objective was ultimately still to board the enemy, in most cases, but by using the ship's lower profile and greater agility to keep the range open, the greater firepower would hopefully batter the enemy ship and crew down to the point that the small but fresh boarding parties on the race-built ship would have a relatively easy job in overwhelming any survivors. It should also be borne in mind that whilst these could be described as heavy guns relative to the anti-personnel weapons found in relatively large numbers on earlier ships, they mostly still were not the kind of heavy guns that you might expect in a classic Age of Sail vessel. There was also the fact that, due to the aforementioned widespread nature of anti-personnel guns, just listing a number of guns can be misleading in this kind of time period, especially for someone who's more familiar with Age of Sail warships. For example, the Great Harry, or Henry Grasse à Dieu, at various times was recorded as carrying well over 150 guns, a number that wouldn't be matched in first-rate ships of the line until pretty much the middle of the 19th century, if at all. However, these were not 150 anti-ship cannon. They were, in large part, small one- and two-man anti-personnel weapons. Very few of those guns would qualify as anti-ship weapons in any way, shape, or form. Whilst the Spanish Armada incident certainly seemed to vindicate the concept, it was not the immediate downfall of the galleon that is sometimes portrayed. The English fleet was not able to decisively defeat the Spanish with guns alone. They certainly did heavy damage, and they avoided defeat themselves, but it was a combination of weather, a lack of vital equipment due to the response to a fireship attack, and the damage done by the guns that cumulatively would finish off the Armada. The later loss of the Revenge, which was Drake's flagship at the time of the Armada battle itself, although its loss happened under a different command, as well as other encounters, emphasised that these ships still had their limits, in no small part due to the more numerous guns aboard these ships still being, as we said, relatively lightweight, if somewhat anti-ship devices. It would need another major war, or series of wars, the Anglo-Dutch Wars, to really embed line-of-battle tactics as the standard and major deciding factor in naval combat, and this needed a change in design from the relatively beamy ships of previous centuries to something still longer. This of course meant proportionally more side compared to bow and stern area, which in turn meant more space for broadside guns, and also made ships less agile, thus requiring the protection of their fellows in action to prevent them from being raked, and hence necessitating the development of squadron line tactics. But in all this, guns had also proliferated in size, type, and role. By the time the prototypical first-rate HMS Sovereign of the Seas finally rolled around, she was stuffed with almost every kind of gun imaginable to gunsmiths of the past couple of hundred years. Now, to give you just some idea of how varied shipboard guns at this time could be, let's just say, shipboard guns of the period included, but were not limited to, the following. Hand cannon, hand mortar, siege cannon, siege mortar, Ribald, Ribald Quinn, Rabinet or Robinet, Robin, Serpentine, Falcon, Falconet, Minion, Demi Saker, Saker, Demi Culverin, Culverin, Culverin Bastard, Demi Cannon, Cannon, Bastard Cannon, Cannon Serpentine, Cannon Royal, Pedrero, Swivel Gun, Bombard, and Basilisk. <laughs> 
There were also a number of qualifiers to gun types, again including, but not limited to, Cut, Fortified, and Drake. And that was just English guns. The Spanish, French, and basically anyone else with any kind of major interest in sea power had their own systems for designation, and could divide up the categories that were given just now even further. And all of these guns had different uses, uh, from small anti-personnel weapons through to massive smashing weapons to long-range high-velocity guns that were designed for accuracy. Now, I'll briefly discuss some of the major types, so this will help draw a line under this era of naval guns before we will move on in the next video to the Age of Sail proper. The first thing that you will have noted in there is that cannon is not the catch-all term that it would become in later times. It was merely one of many types of naval gun. So, the qualifiers first. A cut was a gun that was shortened for its bore and shot weight compared to the average. Kind of like the sawn-off shotgun of the naval firearms world. A fortified gun was, like the cut, somewhat short for its overall bore, but this type of weapon was created by making the gun disproportionately more substantial than average, as compared to the cut, which was, well, a cut-down weapon. And then you have the drake, which was a gun that was made lighter than average for its size, usually with somewhat thinner walls. The drake in particular was notable as it meant that you could carry either larger guns or more guns than the ship that in question could typically carry, which was something that would see a bit of a resurgence in the 19th century US Navy ship of the line. Now as for the guns themselves, in ascending order of size approximately, let's have a look at some of these. The Serpentine was a small relative of the Culverin. It was a high-end weapon, but it was designed for anti-personnel use due to its relatively small size. Uh, the Falcon was a slightly larger anti-personnel and small boat weapon that was just about large enough to fire grape shot as opposed to a single, uh, single shot. Generally speaking, it had a similar relationship to the Cannon as the Serpentine did to the Culverin, thus making it an iron gun as opposed to the Serpentine, which was generally a bronze weapon. There was the Falconet, which was just a smaller version of the Falcon, and then we had the Minion. Now, with a shot weight of around five pounds, this was the smallest gun that, up until the Armada era, was regarded as being a useful anti-ship weapon. A great many guns that were carried on smaller and faster ships would be Minions, with falcons or falconets being used to ca cover the anti-personnel role. The demi saker was roughly equivalent to the minion, where the minion was the iron gun and the demi saker was the bronze weapon. The saker was a medium weight version of the culverin. It fired a slightly heavier shot than the minion, with a reasonably larger powder charge, which gave it significantly more striking power and range. Then you have the demi culverin. This was a scaled-down culverin that sat between a saker and a full-size culverin. The culverin itself was a long-barrel, high-velocity weapon regarded as a first-class gun, and the preferred, if somewhat expensive, armament for large ships due to their longer range and superior accuracy. They were almost indelibly found cast in bronze during the medieval period. Then you have the amusingly named Culverin Bastard, and boy is that going to get this video demonetized if I have to say that enough times, um, a hybrid weapon that was more of the weight and size class of a demi culverin, but would fire a much heavier shot with a minimally increased powder charge. Uh, because of this mix of near culverin shot and near demi culverin powder, it attracted the name as it was uh, an unholy crossbreed of the two but it allowed you to fire a relatively heavy ball on a relatively smaller platform as compared to a full culverin. Then you have the demi cannon. Like the demi culverin, this sat between the cannon, and in this particular case as a mostly iron gun, the minion. Although due to the starting point of the cannon as a gun with a relatively heavy shot weight, 
Even a demi-cannon would often fire a shot that was heavier than that of a full-size culverin, although with considerably less accuracy and range. The cannon was a general-purpose gun, usually made of iron, and regarded as something of a common or second-class weapon compared to the culverin. It was designed to fire a relatively large shot using a medium to low charge of powder, in large part due to the recognition of the limitations on iron guns of the period. Ironically enough, relative to the culverin, the cannon occupied the slot that, in many ways, the carronade would later come to occupy in relation to what would commonly be called ship's cannon in the classic age of sail. The bastard cannon, much like the culverin bastard, was a hybrid of the demi cannon and cannon along pretty much the same lines. The cannon serpentine was an attempt to blend the cheapness and heavy shot of a cannon with the longer barrel of a culverin. Without the increased thickness, it had a slender appearance, hence the name, and would normally be the gun you wanted to stay as far away from as possible, since it packed a fair amount of powder and a very large shot into a fairly large bore, but was made of iron as opposed to bronze. Then you had the Cannon Royal, or Cannon Real. This was the largest gun that you might reasonably expect to find afloat. It fired an extremely large and heavy shot that was not particularly manageable. For this reason, it wasn't very common, and more often it would be found as a forward fixed gun for sieges, or perhaps a prestige piece that actually had relatively little practical value, as this type of gun was more often found in siege trains on land. The Pedrero was a relatively large gun that sat between culverins and cannons in terms of bore size, but was specifically noted as primarily intended to throw stone shot, and thus it could be made considerably lighter compared to a culverin or cannon uh, for its bore size due to the fact that stone shot weighed considerably less than an iron ball of the same size. Most accounts that relate to Pedreros either note the extreme bravery or recklessness of somebody who tried to fire a Pedrero using a much heavier iron shot, or else were just plastered with warning saying never, never, ever do that. So it was in fact possible to have a cut demi-culverin drake. That would indicate a lighter weight version of the culverin firing an 8-9 to nine pound shot that had been cut down to have a shorter barrel. Now, as indicated previously, and you might appreciate somewhat more from that listing, there were two lines of guns. More expensive, high-quality, longer-range weapons generally made of bronze, which were the culverins, sakers, and serpentines, and the cheaper, slightly more prone to explosion, but much more easily accessible weapons made from iron, uh, that nonetheless could fire considerably heavier shot at the upper end of things, these being the cannons, minions, and falcons, along with their derivatives. Now, of course, gun, shot, and charge weights in any list are only approximations, especially in this period when standardization very much was not a thing. Not only did different nations use different rating systems, but even guns listed as a given type might vary considerably in the three weight categories. You might find the odd iron culverin or bronze cannon around as well, and that's before you got into subdivision systems, where you might find anything from half a dozen to two dozen further variances on what exactly constituted a cannon or a culverin. Despite the limitations of iron, the iron guns were typically less massive for their bore than the bronze guns, which was compensated for by considerably smaller charges in proportion to shot weight, thus giving a greater margin of safety which reflected the issues with iron construction for the guns at the time. As weird and wonderful as that system was, there were two major flaws, one being the labyrinthine nature of the various national rating systems resulted in dozens of different powder charges and shot weights, as well as shot sizes, being needed for every single ship that carried more than a couple of dozen guns and getting it mixed up could be absolutely disastrous. As mentioned, an iron ball in a Pedrero could easily cause the gun to explode on ignition of the powder, 
a cannon's charge in a culverin would result in the ball not really travelling far enough or with enough energy to reach an enemy ship or do any real damage if it somehow made it, whereas a culverin's charge in a demi cannon would create a gigantic iron pipe bomb and trying to cram a saker's ball into the similar size but slightly different falcon would simply result in an inability to load the gun, which wasn't particularly helpful in battle. And so as a result, as the 17th century drew on and large fleets of dedicated warships and line-of-battle tactics began to standardise, so too would the guns. To a certain degree, this was helped by the change to the a primarily gun-based approach to battles, and many of the smaller pieces that would sit halfway between anti-personnel and anti-ship weapons were no longer required. Additionally, the reliability of iron working for the production of naval guns was constantly improving, and so larger numbers of relatively standardised iron weapons that probably wouldn't explode and could begin to approach the performance of bronze guns began to appear. Bronze itself also became ever more expensive, but it would persist for the largest guns, which were both the most prestigious and the most dangerous, and these would be installed on flagships and the like where their additional power was appreciated and their costs somewhat justified. Further, the various terms for guns began to die out, with the term cannon gradually coming to apply to most naval guns, albeit that the simple gun was just as common. The irony of this was that over time, the 42 pounder which was the most common shot weight for a cannon in the medieval classification, would eventually die out, as 42 pound shot was just a bit too heavy for easy management in a seaway in battle in a ship of the period. The 32 to 36 pounders that would form the general heavy gun armament in a typical engagement in a classic age of sail ship of the line battle would actually, in this period, have been defined as demi cannon. But all of that was for the future. For now, we'll wrap up here, having taken a journey from the first guns aboard ships to the dawn of the line of battle era. The series will continue later this year with three further sections, guns of the age of sail, guns of the age of steam and iron, and finally, guns of the age of steel. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.